Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39 says, One day some teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees came. Pastor Kurt, if you're watching, I hope, I mean, most likely he's at church tonight. But just in case we miss you. And uh, come home quick. The good news is when he's coming back, he's bringing family back. So we're excited about that. One day, some teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But that kind of put all of us in a position there, didn't it? Didn't it? Because many people come to church looking for miraculous signs. But that word, their demand, is very, very important. Because to demand a sign from God in order for him to prove himself puts you in a different category from those who want a sign because they know that God is able to prove the power of God. Jesus himself, when he stood outside Lazarus' tomb, he said, so that they will know that you sent me. So there's nothing wrong when you ask God to show his power and his glory. But to demand a sign from God in exchange for faith is to blackmail God. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus, it is you that we believe. It is you that we love. It is you that we honor tonight. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity to, to present your word to your people. I ask you for your Holy Spirit anointing. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You are revered. You are honored, oh God. And we thank you, Father, for the blessing of this day. We thank you, oh God, for this world that is still turning today. We thank you, oh God, for the air in our lungs, for the breath that we breathe, and the ability to comprehend the word of God as you reveal it by your spirit. Holy Father, we pray that your name is glorified in this sanctuary we pray oh god that your believers those who love your name will see your glory in the land of the living we pray oh god that even as sin abounds that grace will show itself that grace will much more abound that your people would be a righteous and a holy nation that we will be the twigs father we will be the beast we will be oh god the weapon in the hand of the lord in this hour father i submit myself my mind my voice my body and my spirit to your word this tonight and I pray God that will reach the ears of the hearer in Jesus name amen you may sit I'm missing a light or something because my Bible is not lit up praise God our God is a sign of a God of signs and wonders and miracles we know that don't we we know that, and, and it seems that every time we come across um, to these kinds of seasons, um, I preach about it. I preach about him being a God of signs and wonders and miracles. And, but I find that we've come to the time in the earth now where signs and wonders and miracles are not enough. Have you noticed that? People are not in awe of miracles and wonders anymore. People don't really want to hear that God is healing cancer anymore. And in fact, people are more willing <clears throat> to hold on to the one skeptic thought than to hold on to news after news about the God who has done the miraculous. It takes more to amaze people. And I believe it's because we live in a world where we're about to see things happen that we've never seen before. How many of you are ready? All right, that's like uh, half of us. I want to know how ready are you? Like for real though, if something happened in this nation, I heard uh, amazing news, Pastor Jude, yesterday. Um, a Supreme Court judge, Ms. Sharon, made it legal for illegal immigrants to carry guns. Yeah, and she passed a, a law. It's now a legal thing. Isn't that great? You, you yes. Um, it, it's their constitutional right to be able to bear weapons, whether or not those are legal weapons. It's their right. It's the craziest thing. We live, that's the world we're living in. Not only that, that's the nation. 
And the, you know what's the weirdest part about all this? It happens and the world keeps turning and nobody's saying anything. Is that crazy to you? Or am I the only one who's in shock and awe? Am I the only one that says, oh God, your word is forever settled in heaven. And it doesn't matter what man says or does. This word will come to pass. I found myself in a strange predicament as a preacher. I don't really, really care about the masses. I don't really care if this church ever grows to be 100,000 people because, because I realize that to have a big crowd that doesn't even know God is irrelevant. To have a crowd that I have to please by saying what you need to hear because you have itching ears will disgrace the heart of God and it will, it will really bear down on the weight of the Holy Spirit. That's what grieves the Holy Ghost and, and I'm not interested in it. Instead, I feel in my spirit a, a, a real desire to have 12, to have people who are just on fire for God and says, you know, come hell or high water, the cross before me and the world behind me everything else can fall by the wayside God there are things that I want and there are things that I've always longed for you might say but you can keep it father if I have you I have everything there are a few people in the earth where that has become your heart's desire where just to be pleasing to the king of kings you see you don't some of us don't realize Today the Lord really showed me. I went to find an offering in my wallet and he gave me another lesson. When I opened my wallet, there were pounds in there and there were blue Trinidadian dollar bills in there. Hundred dollar bills and pounds. And so I was going to grab, but this is from my, you know, traveling. I just leave the change in my wallet, but I couldn't find any American dollars. And I heard the spirit of the Lord say in a few days, you won't be able to find it. And I was like, Lord, what are you trying to say? He says in a few days, they won't be relevant anymore. It will be worth nothing. This is not me predicting gloom and doom to you, but this is me telling you don't hold on too lightly, tightly, because you will lose something when that thing goes down the drain I hope you guys know that oil is traded in the US dollar if you know that put your hand up in order to buy and sell oil even though we are not oil producers you have to buy US currency well that is no longer so as of this year they are beginning to change the currency in which oil is traded when the US dollar is no longer attached to the cost of a barrel of oil what the what economic Economics and, and economists say is the bottom is going to fall out of the dollar. Because we are already, you know, this doesn't sound like a sermon, but we're going there. We're talking about the sign of the prophet Jonah. If the dollar, if the bottom of our dollar falls out, then you, you're complaining now about having to spend $3.25 on one loaf of bread. I mean, you're talking about the 12 grain type, right? Three twenty-five. But I promise you, if that happens, your three twenty-five won't buy you a slice of bread. You might, you, now, the Bible tells us what to do, though. It's so funny. The Bible says there are certain things that you want to, 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 that will last, but there are other things that will not last. One thing that won't last is paper money. And so I'm, I'm just out here to warn people and tell the church. So when well, you can get mad at me now, and then you can blame me later, and then you can say nobody told you. But I'm here to tell you that God says, if you want to hold on to it, you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. If you want money, then you'll have money but that money will be worth nothing dude in a very very short time it's going to take much more to do what you do now with what you have so if the little that you have we're stingy with it in this hour you just wait to see what's about to happen but I thank God that last year at this time God gave this church a word he said the plagues are coming and the lights are about to go out but there'll always be a light in Goshen he said I'm going to preserve my people in the place that I have prepared for them not everybody believes that brother Dennis but I believe that because I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in God and I've watched as floods happen and people were scared what were scared and I've watched as they lost home and family and I watched the Lord preserve us and not only did he preserve us but he provided for us he provided in the day of lack and I'm telling you that if he did it before he can do it again 
It is not false hope to put your trust in Jesus. Instead, it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word and to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus says the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, thus says the Lord. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one dot, not one cross T of the word of the Lord will pass away. I'm here to tell you that math as you know it, and English as you know it, and social studies as you know it, will pass away. In fact, history has already been altered. Social studies has already become different. Math itself as you know it, according to Einstein, there are no whole numbers. Let me not even get into that. This could last a long time. What is my point? The things that you see as definitive in this world that you've based your life on, ones, twos, points, and zeros, do not matter. I can't say it loud enough and long enough. Do not put your trust in numbers and letters. Do not put your trust in mankind. Do not trust in chariots and horses. Do not trust in cars and houses. Do not trust in presidents and governments. Do not not trust in mankind but put your trust in the Lord they that trust in the Lord they will be like Mount Zion which cannot be removed but abides forever and friend if you got an amen in that little too if you've not uttered the praise of the Lord in a hundred years today is your day because there will come a day there will come a day in the very near future when your amen will bounce right back and hit you in the face but I'm telling you while there's breath in your lungs you give God a note of praise you let your voice be heard in heaven because he is worthy my mother says, don't buy me flowers when I'm dead. She tells me that all the time. She said, don't call me. Don't buy me flowers. Don't tell people how much you like me. Tell me now. She said, give me flowers now. Call me now while I can hear it. I'm here to tell you, don't try to tell God what he means when you see him face to face. Tell him now. Honor him now. Praise him now. Give him the glory now. Give him your strength now. Give him your time now. Give him your everything now these people come to Jesus and they say give us a sign and we'll believe you I get Jesus when he got mad I get it because when they tell me that no I get mad because I want to say, you don't deserve a sign. I want to say, who, who are you? Who am I that he should be mindful? Who are we that he needs to prove himself to me? Who are you but a worm? You see, the biggest problem in the earth right now, humanism says you are not a worm. Humanism says that you are worth a lot, that you are valuable based on your own composition, your own mind, your own ability to, to think and to be and you think and therefore you are. I beg to differ because the crap some of us think is better that we weren't. You don't think and therefore you are. He created you and therefore you are. You know why you are? Because you are. You know why you are? Because he is. He said, I am that I am. He holds all things together, it says in the book of Acts. It's so hilarious. Like, the world is so segmented, not segregated, but segmented. We are also segregated, but this message is not about that. The world is so segmented that there are things that are going on right under our noses which say, look, the end is near. God is about to come back. This world is not going to keep spinning the way you expect it to. We, there are so many things, but we live in our little microcosms and our little bubbles that we don't see anything else that's going on. You know, if I preach about CERN, then everybody's excited. Because you want to know about the Antichrist and you want to know what is happening way over there where they have, you know, where they're splitting atoms and exploding things. 
I love to watch those documentaries when they talk about the Big Bang like they were there. 150 billion years ago. And then for me to say the heavens declare his glory, I sound like the crazy one. I sound like the crazy one because there are things that science can never prove. But do you know what science does prove? 100% infallibly, science proves that somebody designed all of this. And that's not me trying to be religious. That's me telling you, go do your own research. Stop believing what everybody says. If, that's probably going to be the motto of my life. And one day, if I die before Jesus comes, they're going to write it on my tombstone. She said, think for yourself. This is really interesting. God has designed everything that you see, everything that you are. You know, we, we heard one preacher talk about it, and we talked about laminin and how everything that holds your body together looks like a cross. I heard one um, secular humanist say, Christians find a cross in everything, that it's not an actual cross. It's a bond that looks like a T. Well, bro, a T looks like a cross. <laughs> and yes, I find Jesus in everything. Because that's what my Bible say, in him where all things were made. And nothing was made without him that is made. For he is and he holds all things together. I'm held together by Jesus Christ. Isn't it funny that biology cannot explain what holds the human body together? It's some sort of substance. They can't explain why there's an electrical spark when a sperm enters an egg and it becomes a... They can't explain it. And every time science can't explain a thing, it just jumps over that and goes to the next thing. Well, I'm here to tell you, my Jesus don't skip spaces. He doesn't. He said, I am the way. If you walk in that way, you're going to know who he is. I'm telling you, one day every eye shall behold him. And I can't wait for the day. So we have this trick. I thought how hilarious it would be if on a day like Sunday when people sleep in, we plan this passage, like you bring us to the close, right? Right, no, we wrap it up and fold it like, and like Zebra bring and like, I get a few people in the church to know it. And while they're sleeping, we put the clothes there, we run downstairs and we blow the shofar. And then when they wake up, we're missing. And then we all lock ourselves in my office so there's nobody around. And when they go downstairs, like, and then when they try to call us, no, my message is gonna say, if you've reached this number, the person you are calling is no longer on earth. Something like that. For those of you who would like to criticize me for that particular joke, R-U-T-H at hopenyc.com, send all your complaints that way. I think that would be hilarious. It sure would prevent them from ever. <laughs> but everything that God designed, he designed on purpose. Well, that, that might sound funny. Pastor, don't joke about your rapture. There ain't nothing, nothing funny about it. If you get left behind tonight. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. And God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be signs to mark the seasons, the days, and the years. You should know this scripture. I've, I've preached from it many times. And let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And this is what happened. That's the scripture. Now, everybody so far has heard that on April 8th, there's going to be a full, complete solar eclipse. How many of you have heard that? Better question, put your hand up. How many of you have not heard that? Okay, I'm preaching to you tonight. To the rest of them too. So there's this solar eclipse that's coming. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? Solar eclipses happen all the time. I just think it was, it's just strange that just a few weeks ago I told you that if ever there's a sign in the moon, it pertains to the people of Israel. If ever there's a sign in the sun, 
it pertains to the world or the particular nation over which that thing happens. If ever there's a sign in the stars, it talks about generational blessing. Abraham, if you can count the number of the stars, you get it. And this thing wasn't on my radar yet. This particular solar eclipse. Why is this one significant? Now, am I telling you Jesus is coming on April 8th? No. Could he? Sure. Right? No, no. Hear this. That's seven days before. <clears throat> um, there's a, a lunar eclipse. Right? So that's pretty interesting too. Why is this one so particular? This one is really great. Because the last time we had one, it was in 2017. How many of you were here? How many of you were with us on the balcony? And we had a, a whole viewing and we had music. It was really great. 2017. And now here we are about six days and six months later. I mean six years and six months. I'm trying. And there's another one. This one's very awesome. You know why? Because the only people in the world that will be able to see this are in America. So let's play quiz. Guess which nation this is for. Very good. You get 10 points. The last time one of these occurred was in 2017. And I told you back in 2017, I remember us having the discussion. I did a teaching on it. And <clears throat> I showed you how the, the path of that solar eclipse was so awesome. Because it was going to go through seven towns with the name Salem. It was going to pass through seven towns in America with the name Salem, which is the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, Jerusalem, right? And that was really cool, right? Seven towns with the name Salem. And what was God saying? That he was going to bring peace to America? He was saying, no, pray for peace in America. You're going to need it for the next season. You need to pray for the peace of God to come on your nation because there's going to be a severe time of unrest. And then we go through what is COVID, a big pestilence. We go through all kinds of social upheavals. Now God alone knows what's happening in the United States of America. We are on the verge of civil war. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? Stop watching CNN. You might want to take that part out of the broadcast. Stop. <sighs> I don't know how to say it again any less. How to hide it and tell you that. Okay. Now this, so that was seven years ago. Now this particular one is interesting. And it also goes through seven cities. Everybody say seven is God's number. It's the number of completion, seven, right? You know that. If you know that, say, I know that. I won't even tell you the number of references in the Bible to the number seven. We all know it's seven trumpets and seven bowls and in seven days. You rested on the seven. It's God's finish. And so this particular um, April 8th solar eclipse is also going to pass through seven towns. Now, it's a really peculiar name, though, because there are only seven towns by this name in the United States of America. And guess what the name is? I'll tell you, Nineveh. Nineveh is the town. It's actually going to pass through Nineveh, New York. Yippee. So this solar eclipse is going to be visible for seven in many towns, but seven, the one town that occurs seven times is the word Nineveh. And you might think, well, that's a coinkydinky. If there were, I don't, I'm saying you might, but it, you know, that's pretty peculiar to me that, wow, because when they asked Jesus, they said, tell us, how will we know that the end is near? And what shall be the sign of your coming? Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but no sign shall be given to that generation, save the sign of the prophet Jonah. It would be bad enough or good enough if that was the sign that we got. But on April 8th, right above the path of the solar eclipse in the United States, a certain constellation is going to be over the United States of America. It's, also, it's called the constellation of the whale. Yet another coincidence. It would be a coincidence if God himself, like I read, hadn't said, I'm putting the stars, I'm putting the sun, and I'm putting the moon in the sky for signs and seasons and times. What is God saying? I'm leaving it up to you to figure it out. 
Now, thank you. So you can put up the path. This is the path of the first one and the path of the second one. And that is the place, oh look, it's an X. It's not a cross, it's an X. Now it's really weird, why? Because one started in the west and finishes in the east and one starts in the east and finishes in the west. But this is really cool because you see where that X crosses there? This is hilarious. The name of that particular town is Joppa. Okay, go home and do your research. That's cute, right? That's not cute. That's terrifying. Now, the thing is, Jesus explained it to them. And they said, he said to them, he said, as you see the son of man, um, the, the son of the prophet Jonah, as he was in the belly of the fish for three days, uh, so shall the son of man be in the belly of the earth for three days. And that's what we know is the sign of the prophet Jonah. But you got to remember when Jesus told them that he wasn't dead yet. So they would have had zero idea what Jesus was talking about when he said the son of man will be in the belly of the fish. But I'm, I will tell you what they knew the, the sign of Jonah was. Because Jonah wasn't an ordinary prophet. You know, when we think about Jonah, we think about this little man, probably somebody like me, but male, running from God, right? But it wasn't that. Jonah was taught by Elisha. Jonah was Elisha, the major prophet's protege. Elisha was in the courts of kings, so was Jonah. There was only one prophet at the time. God always sent a man, a man. There are few with contemporary prophets like Nehemiah and Obadiah, but Jonah was the man. So when God sent Jonah, he sent his guy. So people would know when Jonah shows up, God is speaking. Now, I've taught you this. Do you remember just the other day we preached this sermon about Jonah? Well, God told Jonah I want you to go to Nineveh in Nineveh the Assyrians live there I know it's too much history stay with me you want to hear this might you know concern you he says go to Nineveh and warn them the Assyrians that they have 40 days somebody say 40 days before I destroy them now that is cool right if you got to go preach that I would hate to preach that message to America I would hate to be the one to bring that news because they will shoot me before the 40 days are over. But this is what Jonah had to go to Nineveh. Now, why was that difficult? If you go to England right now to the museum of, um, I don't remember which one it is, but I know it's free. We were just there. All the museums in England are free. Um, if you go there, there is a display there right now. Strange enough, and I thought we were going on vacation. There is a display right there from the Assyrian Empire. And they have frescoes and, and uh, um, engravings on tablets there taken from that exact time, about 700 BC. And guess what's on the walls? The atrocities that they committed on the Israelites, on the Hebrews. They impaled them alive and hung them to die. They lit them a fire and made them human torches. And so, listen, this is so great. You know what happened one day? The Syrians were coming against the Hebrews and then God couldn't handle that anymore. He didn't want to. So he sent one angel... And one angel destroyed 180 something thousand Assyrians in one day. But what did the king do? He went back to Nineveh and instead of documenting the defeat, he made frescoes to himself about all the atrocities he committed on the Hebrews. So for Jonah to go to Nineveh and warn them, he would have had to pass by the city walls watching what they had done to his people and watching what, what you get what I'm saying? So, let me tell you how it kind of happened. The Israelites were just doing their thing. You see, they were living in a place that people didn't think they should have been living in. They were occupying. But they were just living there because God said it was theirs. But the people who thought it rightfully belonged to them decided to make a surprise attack. I know you've never heard about this. This is how history was. And they slaughtered them unprovoked and the popular opinion of the day turned against the people of God so Jonah went 
You ever wondered though, the scripture says that Jonah went after the fish swallowed him, vomited him out. He, finally, he went to Nineveh. And the Bible says, and the king repented. And then it said the whole nation repented. And then it said even the cows were fasting. Have you ever wondered how is that likely? That does not seem likely. I have never preached anywhere where every single person got saved. But he got a whole nation, including the cows, to get saved? Why? How is that possible, Jude? NASA gave us the answer. Yeah, that NASA. In 726 BC. How can we actually tell you the actual day? Because this particular day is not just scriptural, it's historical. And NASA, because God created the heavens and the earth cyclically, and we could accurately pinpoint times when things have happened in the past, they can take you all the way back to the day God said Jonah went to Nineveh, which was the first of Elul. It's Jewish history. On the first of Elul, in that year 726 BC, guess what happened over Nineveh? A solar eclipse. So you will have no sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah walks into Nineveh and in the middle of the day, the sky grows dark. And Jonah says, the God of Israel says you have 40 days. So what we've had is 184,000 people dead in one day. A prophet just got vomited out by a whale, probably looking like a ghost. Walks into town when the whole sky grows dark. And he said, you are for Of course they repented. And God said, when the end is near, you'll see the sign. And dude, what? Seven Ninevehs? For the past, there's so much more. Can you put the um, you can put the one with the galaxies? You see these galaxies? This one is just one. Do you know how many they are? Me neither. <laughs> Each one of those galaxies has billions and billions of stars in them. And there are billions and billions and billions of them. Now scientists say that the ones that are farthest away, which they say are billions of light years away, light years are measured in time, not in distance. That means they believe that the light from some of those galaxies have been coming to us here for billions of years. And that they just got here. Possible. Possible. Is the earth he created in six days a few thousand years ago. But all that stuff could have been there before. But this is one thing I want you to consider. When you consider the galaxies, oh my goodness, they declare the glory of the Lord. The Bible says the heavens declare his majesty. To declare means to speak out loud. And the Bible says that we may not be hearing, but it doesn't mean that they're not speaking. And do you know like those things that are, that, that these things on the side that come out, that when something spins in a, in a circle like that, and the, the forces of... Um, the centrifugal forces, and, and those are called arms, obviously arms. And if you've ever had a pencil and you tied a string to it and you went around like this, the more you turn it, the tighter those arms get. You know what I'm talking about, right? It stands to reason and time and physics that if those things that are far away have been turning for billions of light years more than the galaxies closest to us, the arms should be tighter wound together. Scientists cannot explain how the galaxies that are farthest away seem to be as young as the galaxies that are closest to us but they're not bothering to explain that I'll tell you why it says it looks as if they all happened on the same day I want you to hear what the Bible says about this it says that he knows listen to this every star by 
There are more stars in just our Milky Way than there are hairs on the head of every human put together. And he knows every star in every galaxy in billions and billions of galaxies, every star has a name and a purpose. You can't comprehend it. And the way of a human is when we cannot grasp, grasp it, we let it go. But you know what he says? He says, think about me. Think about God. Let it hurt your brain. Let it blow your mind. That's why the psalmist says, who am I that you are mindful of me? And the son of man that you would consider him. Because the heavens themselves speak of the glory. Can we just say amen? amen. In Psalms 19 and 1 to 4, the psalmist said, The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Hear this. And the skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound and without a word. And you may not be able to hear their voice. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their voice throughout the world. What is he talking about? Satan has hijacked every single design of God to communicate with his people. Every time, every, every method of worship, of warfare, Satan took it. And every method of warning. So music was how we were supposed to communicate with God. God invented music. Music is God's thing. But really and truly, the, the church is busy now trying to emulate the world and get music back. Why do we have to take back what belonged to our God from the very beginning? Why? He who invented it. The Bible says he dances and rejoices over me with singing. Why does dance belong to the world when the one who created the world dances over me and sings over me and laughs over me and rejoices over me? Art. The enemy took that. Now if it's gross and disgusting and vulgar, it's considered art. words language and speech was God's invention remember at Babel he confused the tongues of men and he made them speak in languages no words are used to curse the very name of God and we pay our monies to pay those people what about our bodies created to worship the Lord the Holy Spirit dwells in these temples but yet those bodies the devil hijacked those bodies as well what about our minds these minds were created so that we could understand God so that we could begin to comprehend his ways but instead the Bible said God had to give us over to a reprobate mind instead we were supposed to be renewed in our inner man we we're not supposed to be be conformed to the world but be transformed by a renewed mind but that's not happening because Satan has us in a box in our mind what about the heavens the heavens were there for signs and warnings, but Satan take what God put there and made it into astrology, the zodiac. You read in your horoscopes, going straight to hell. Okay, I can't judge you like that. But the Bible says it's, it's, it's witchcraft. Right? So if I say, who's a Gemini? Don't put up your hand. I'm not actually asking. When I ask you if you're a Gemini, right? Or if you're a Virgo or a Libra. You know what I'm essentially asking you? Not what month you were born. But under which particular con constellation that month fell in in the year that you were born. Isn't that crazy? And you want to hear something else that's funny? How many of you can, can spot any of the constellations and you know them? Okay, how many can find the Big Dipper? Okay, how many can you find, um, have you can find Orion? Pleiades? Cassiopeia? <laughs> 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 
Okay, I hear you. Pasta, we born in New York. We never see a star yet. I'm gonna bring a planetarium to this church and put you guys in there. You guys need to go to Africa and lay down in the, in the, in the ground and watch up in the sky when, no, when, when light pollution hasn't dimmed the look of the stars. And I remember being in San Antonio on the river one day, lying in this boat, watching up at the skies in the middle of the night. And I think, and now I've seen the stars in a million places, but that night I probably counted about 23 shooting stars in one night. You were there. It was crazy. One night I was on my way to Africa and because of the time difference, we were now six hours different and I fell asleep and woke up in the middle of the night, but I didn't know it. And I opened the window and put my face up to the window to see before I had opened my eyes. And uh, Carmel, in about 10, Five minutes, I was bawling so hard because the only thing I could describe it as was being like literally visually assaulted by the stars. Hit me like a ton of bricks. I had never seen so many billions of stars so big and close to my face. It rocked me. But do you know when we think about the constellations and when you think about things like Taurus and Virgo, right? And they say, okay, this one is the virgin. I don't care how I cross my eyes, I'm not seeing no virgin. <laughs> it don't look like no bull and it certainly don't look like no scale. Because we think that they, this is the story they tell our children, that people looked up at the sky and imagined things and wrote stories. It's the other way around. Jewish history has the exact names or very, very similar names to the ones that we use in English. But Jewish history says that those names came from Adam and Enoch. So Virgo is actually the story of a virgin. The constellations actually begin with Virgo and end with Leo. And the whole thing tells a story of a virgin who gives birth and it ends with a conquering lion. Somewhere in the middle there, there is a lamb with its head on a, its heel on a snake's head. When the, the psalmist says the heavens declare his glory, yeah. Satan had to hijack that. And to make sure that you would never see the story, the greatest story ever told was written in the stars. It was written from the minute that God said, I'll put it for anyone who would dare look up. And for those of you skeptical Pharisees, I want to leave you with one verse that will change your mind. From the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job. Job said in 38 and 31, can you direct the movement of the stars? Binding the cluster of Pleiades or loosening the cords of Orion? So, pastor, guess what NASA tells us? That there are only two constellations of stars that are gravitationally affected. All other stars are in the vacuum of space unaffected by that force called gravity, except Pleiades and Orion. Tell me how somebody 6,000 years ago without the instruments and knowledge of modern man who just discovered that could be able to write to God. I'll tell you how.
because only God could tell him that. Only God could tell him that. On April 8th, 2024, the United States of America will see something that happened in 2017 and the last time a complete solar eclipse happened before 2017 was in the year 1776. And you don't know what that means. It was the year of the Declaration of Independence. If you want to believe that God is not speaking, it's on you. I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to warn you. One of the places that, the exact place that this eclipse is going to to begin in the United States of America is where the last Confederate flag during the Civil War was buried in the exact part. And I think God is saying that our country is going to be divided. Jude remember red guys and blue guys nailed to a police station that was 10 years ago when the Lord showed me that these people young men lose their limbs are nailed alive in red and in blue and the only way I could describe it to my family was they look like soldiers in the Civil War. And when I saw that this is coming and when I, I hear the prophets and I hear people saying seven Ninevehs and America has to wake up, I just wanna tell my church this. I wanna tell you that they had 40 days and it just so happened that on the first of Elul when Jonah walked into Nineveh and he gave them the warning, 40 days from then was the day of atonement. It was judgment day. But because they had repented and turned from their ways, they were spared. None of that is a coincidence. Church, whether or not that solar eclipse represents anything for our country waits to be seen. But it surely is the day for repentance. God is saying, wake up now. You don't have much time. You can't continue to live the way you want to live and, and doubt God the way that you want to live and live a wishy-washy life. God is saying it's now or never. But isn't he so gracious that he will warn us? Don't be left behind because it's not a joke. Put up the last picture. If you were at If you were at church on Friday night, then you saw this. This was the vision the Lord gave me during riot. And he did, I described it. I saw many, many millions of people going to what looks like heaven. And, and there's this massive steel, solid steel gate. And the emblem on the gate is of a man, like the toilet man, I call him. But there is an opening. And that was a quick but very distinct vision the Lord gave me. And I heard the Lord say, humanism, humanism. And this, this um, image was generated by artificial intelligence. I went on AI and I described as best as I could the vision. And it popped up a hundred pictures for me to look at. And when my eyes saw this, it was like seeing my vision again. It hit me like that. And the word of the Lord to us, to me, he said, I'm going to give you an opening. I'm giving you a small window of time. And if you tell them, they'll come in. They'll make it. 
as many as you can tell will make it. But then that door will be shut. And I said, God, why would you shut the door? And he said, I didn't shut the door. He said, I'm opening the door. But you know what humanism says? There is no God. Humanism says that man is the height of wisdom. It says every man for himself and your biggest goal in life is to be happy, wealthy, prosperous, and ambitious. And this is how God describes it. He says in the last day, men will be lovers of themselves. And on their hand and their hands, they'll receive a number, which is 666. And for those of you who think you're going to get tattooed, think again. Because you might have received that mark and didn't even know it. Because the number 666 just, just means the number of man. The Jews were given the word of God on their hands and their forehead. And God said in the last days, they'll receive that number on their hands and foreheads. What is God saying? That men will replace the word of God with the wisdom of man. They teach it in our schools. They propagate it in the media. People who believe in God are regressive. They're stupid. You're ashamed to say you vote on the side of the Bible. Because we vote on every other ground. We're ashamed to speak up when atrocities are being propagated on people that don't deserve it. We're afraid every man for himself. But church, God has opened up the window for us. So pray for me. I'm going to Canada. Maybe for the last time. But it doesn't matter because if you will help me, then God says he'll bring them home. If you'll tell somebody, he'll bring them home. But if they don't have a preacher, they'll never hear the gospel. You think people out there know, they don't know. You'll be surprised how many people just don't know the gospel. Stand with me. The next total solar eclipse will be in 20 years. Hebrews 1 and 3. It says, God upholds the universe by the words of his mouth. That's a big deal. Tonight is, you know, before we call you up and pray for your healing and stuff like that, we're not going to be long today. I'll have you out of here in no time. It's not going to be like Friday. <laughs> But there are people who need to be saved. Because I promise you, there's no place in heaven for cowards. But I never thought I'd live to see the day where accepting Jesus required an act of bravery. Never thought. Before it was just shame. Now you literally have to be brave. And we're, but trust me, we're not persecuted, you know. It's coming, but we're not there. And we're still coward. And I'm looking for this generation to be bolder. There's no room for the coward. I know you got the adultery, murder, lies thing down. You don't do that. But what about coward? It's listed right there in the list of people who don't inherit the kingdom. So if there's anybody here... And you have heard the word of God and you want to be saved. You don't want to go to hell. But you want if the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, that you get caught up to meet him in the air. I don't want nobody holding up my foot when I go in up. That was a joke. But if that's you and you want to be saved tonight, you want to give your heart to Jesus 
and make your way to heaven a sure thing, I want you to lift your hand right where you are and I will pray for you. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? Everybody else is saved? I'm going to just ask you, you okay with going to hell? Because you are ashamed that people would think you're a sinner? That day is over. Nobody cares. Leave the light on. I want people to see us. Put it back on. Is there anybody else that needs to repent and give your lives to Jesus? So if he comes tonight, you will be saved. Shoot your hand up in the air, up really high. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, daughter. Anybody else? There's a different kind of Christian being saved. It's not the kind that's coming for the healing. It's not the time that kind that's coming for the miracle. It's the kind that's coming for salvation. Seriously. I didn't come for stuff, so if he gives me no stuff, I will still serve him till the day that I die. If you come for stuff and you don't get stuff, you're going to leave him. But if you came because you know you're a sinner and you need salvation, you'll never leave him. If you just lifted your hand, come and meet me up in the front. We're going to pray right here in this corner. On this side, on the right of me, anybody who's sick or you have a need, you can come there. But on this side, I want all those of you who just pray, put your hand up to come and meet me right here. Not going to beg you. 